Hello and welcome to this RCR Wireless webinar entitled Smart Cities, How Will You and Your City Be Impacted? Thank you for joining us. This 60-minute webinar will bring together a panel of industry experts from ABI Research, City Innovate, Compass Intelligence, and Cordon to discuss how smart city technology can shape the future. Topics to be ex explored include smart city cost savings for governments, citizens, and enterprises an exploration of the CEA Cordant Smart Cities Benefit Index rating, Rankings, the role of smart city marketplaces and open platforms, successful case studies of smart city technology implementations, among other topics. My name's Ben Stone and I'm Client Services with RCR Wireless, and I want to review a few housekeeping items with you before we begin. Please take a moment to familiarize yourself with the Zoom webinar interface. Um, have a look at the Q&A feature where you can ask questions to our panelists uh, later on, where we might answer, where we will answer later on. <clears throat> a recording of this panel will be available on demand after its conclusion, and you'll receive an email when it's available for viewing. Now, allow me to introduce today's speakers and get this webinar started. Today, we'll be joined by Stephanie Atkinson of Compass Intelligence, Dominique Bonti of ABI Research, Cameron Sadecki of City Innovate Foundation, and Vanya Sabotik of Cordon in Interdigital Business. And now uh, I'd love to pass it over to Vanya to kick us off. Thank you so much, Ben. So the order that we're gonna do this webinar is that Stephanie and Dominic will present their views on the smart city market followed by Cameron, who's going to be giving us, giving us an overview of the Smart City Project Governance. And then I will uh, finish the webinar with a discussion of our marquee deployment of a transport data marketplace. So with that, I hand it over to Stephanie. Great. Thank you, Vanya. So next slide, please. So just a little bit about myself. I'm the founder and CEO of Compass Intelligence and recently um, worked very closely with InterDigital on really evaluating the smart cities uh, market space. And we found that there are, there's quite a bit of research out there today that's focused on who's smart now, but we really wanted to take a unique approach to our research to really focus in on which of the cities we believe will benefit the most. And as we went through that research process, we learned quite a bit. Next slide. So when thinking about, you know, the cities, it's, you know, and who's going to be impacted, it's really important to think about all of the stakeholders. So it's not just the government officials, it's not just the, you know, citizens, it's also government workers, it's regulatory bodies, it's all of the various departments and agencies that might work under that municipality. So it's really important to think through the stakeholders first and foremost. So before we get started into diving into the impact areas, I want to talk a little bit about um, really what our definition is around smart city. So we believe a smart city is open, high tech, they're eco-friendly, responsive, and of course, innovative. They also support citizens with optimized public services and also enhanced connectivity, both socially and technologically. So let's talk about the impact areas. There's a number of areas, and this is really just a short snapshot because the breadth of this market space, and I actually, you know, refrain myself from calling it a market because as we dive into smart city areas, we really start to understand that there are so many core applications and areas that might even be specific to one or a few departments or agencies, and some might actually work across different agencies and departments. So of course, impact areas that we've identified, fostering of innovation and in startups, as mentioned, um, you know, you think about cities that have, that are really enveloping that startup and tech world, they're also um, embracing tech incubators and co-working spaces within the cities that actually helps foster that innovation. The, in addition to that, the innovation in really embracing technology to really attract companies and businesses to the city. Also, from a technology perspective, the use of sensors, smart meters, um, all of these great IoT technology and applications to enhance the infrastructure of a city and improve the citizen services, moving from that static um, more physical world to a digital um, world. And of course, in addition to that, we focus on kind of the whole sustainability of cities. 
looking at leveraging green technology and other eco-friendly initiatives to really advance the city. Um, in addition, um, we also explore leveraging, you know, kind of that whole mobile digital um, um, application and software perspective and even mobile app perspective to really enhance citizen facing services, whether that be um, e-commerce or alert notification or public safety. There's a whole host of areas of, of impact there. And then, of course, to round it out, um, leveraging best in class technology. Um, providing for a more open and open government, so sharing of data and leveraging that data across departments and agencies. And then, of course, um, we mentioned infrastructure earlier, but that also we find a lot of activity around transit and transportation systems, better routing of traffic, better servicing of our citizens and community as they go from point A to point B. And then, of course, data analytics, leveraging real-time analytics and the information from that from that data to focus on safety management and routing, um, whether that be assets, fleet, um, citizens, transportation, a whole host of areas. And then last, cross collaboration. We believe that there are kind of three components to really um, uh, focus in on what really makes a city smart today. I think you have to have a smart city development, planning, leadership body in place. You really need to have uh, you know, a, a, an actual plan in place. And then lastly, you need to have some real live initiatives being deployed, not just in one particular department or agency, but across agencies. Next slide, please. And as part of the research, we dove into a couple of recommendations. I'm going to highlight four here. First, um, smart city development is really an organizational challenge as much as it is, it's an organizational challenge as much as it is, it is technological. So that's one of the points is why we have to have kind of an overarching planning body in place because if we plan individually in silos, um, we have less collaboration with data sharing, we have less focus on leveraging resources across departments and agencies, et cetera. Also, U.S. cities, they're unique in their characteristics, so some smart city solutions may not be, um, you know, an opportunity for all, you know, whether it's a small city versus a large city versus a more advanced city versus, you know, rural versus urban. There are varying needs that uh, and priorities that might be in place. Um, and then next, we need to form collaborations. I mentioned that earlier, so I'm not going to dive in too much on that. And then last, cities will save money and accelerate smart city deployments by selecting open-ended and standard-based solutions. And that's something um, that we believe will, will have to take place in order to move forward. And I'm gonna hand it off to our next presenter. And um, one thing to note before, I, before we move on is this research next week, we'll, we will have a, an executive summary that will be available for download on the Interdigital Cordon um, website. So if you wanna dive further into the Smart Cities Benefit Index and, and which cities rank the highest, there'll be a great uh, wealth of information um, on the site next week. Okay, thanks, Stephanie. So this is uh, Dominic Bont. I'm uh, Managing Director and VP at um, uh, Market Technology Research Company, uh, ABI Research. Uh, very happy to, to be part of this panel today. So I'm going to talk about a white paper that was published a couple of days ago. It's available for download uh, on the Interdigital website. And it's really focused on the cost savings opportunity of smart city technologies. So we you know, looked at this from uh, various different angles, the technology angle, the, the stakeholders, uh, citizens, enterprise, of course, the city government itself. And we came with a you know, very significant cost saving opportunity, $5 trillion globally, and that's probably even a conservative estimate. So if you think about this, obviously uh, cities are often still run very inefficiently and there's huge scope for, you know, efficiency improvements. Now, for example, uh, you know, striving for or towards higher asset utilization rates, whether it's vehicles or buildings or roads. And, and of course, from a government or a city government perspective, uh, obviously cost saving is a key focus. They have to work within limited and, and often fixed budgets. And we saw really good confirmation uh, uh, of that in a recently held webinar where uh, a poll question was asking for main benefits of smart cities. 
cost savings came, came up first. We also saw it in a survey we did, a uh, government survey uh, with respondents from governments, local and national governments, and again it showed as the, the, the main priority. It's kind of not a surprise, I think cities need to you know, maximize the value derived from taxpayers' monies, and they are typically, of course, by, by the very nature of, of the, the, the public uh, services they offer, uh, or not not profit, so they need to look at costs more than maybe at the generating uh, new revenues. So, of course, if you think cost savings, at the same time, it, it kind of uh, represents a key driver for IoT tech deployments, uh, building positive business cases with, with fast uh, ROI is, of course, so much easier when you can identify an immediate or at least a tangible uh, cost saving uh, in, in the short term. And of course, it's not just about the governments uh, running their infrastructure more efficiently. It's also, of course, about what this means for citizens and enterprises. They can benefit from the more affordable services and especially important for disadvantaged communities and poor areas that they can continue to live in cities uh, going forward. I think cost savings need to be seen also in the wider uh, range of benefits. I think it's very much linked to livability, safety, but maybe even more so to economic development, you know, attracting enterprises. That's why we also looked at enterprises as part of this uh, uh, white paper going forward. But I think at the same time, a lot of that cost saving tech is, of course, at the same time also contributing to sustainability. So a couple of metrics and, and you know, numbers we uh, kind of uh, uh, presented as part of the white paper is, so I, I mentioned the five trillion global opportunity in cost savings. This is kind of split in, you know, 580 billion for governments, 1.7 trillion for enterprises, and the biggest one actually for the citizens themselves, 3.15 a trillion dollar of global cost savings. If you look at this from a city perspective, and, and let's take a, you know, a large mega city of around 10 million people, we identified like $46 billion in uh, cost savings. And again, this uh, uh, is distributed uh, across governments. We found that you know the, the main areas for cost savings include employee, uh, cost of employees, employment, uh, capex investments, you know, think roads, buildings, and, and other parts of the infrastructure, and energy. For citizens, uh, that represents about 27 billion of cost savings for that uh, kind of average city. Uh, mobility is kind of the key uh, expense where cost savings can be achieved. Uh, and then second came in housing and third utilities, uh, both energy, but also water, gas, telecommunications. For enterprises, again, 14 billion uh, opportunity for cost savings. Employees, you need to think about enterprises, of course, most of them being service-oriented, the ones that are, are kind of located within cities, but also transportation, uh, buildings uh, are also very uh, important areas. I think, if you think about the size of the cities, it, it's pretty clear that the larger the city, uh, the, the larger the cost-saving opportunity. If you think in terms of their scale and the density, which in, in particular leads to higher you know, possibility for reaching efficiencies for transportation, energy, kind of demand response and mechanics work better in those kind of environments. I think if you look at developed versus developing regions, you know, if you look at cities in developed regions, uh, often tech needs to be installed as a retrofit, which kind of is harder to do. It might be slower as well, whereas, I mean, certain cities in developing regions can kind of you know, build technology into their uh, city expansion plans, which makes for faster rollouts. So some, some other areas we should highlight in terms of cost savings, maybe the ones not so often mentioned, is education, uh, healthcare, and insurance. If you think about education and healthcare, there's huge scope for, uh, uh, you know, offering these services online and remotely. There's also huge scope for prevention in, for example, healthcare, an, an area where city government should play a, a, a big role in. And that's where, you know, an area where technology can help us quite a, lit, a, a lot. Similarly, for insurance, there's a lot of talk about, you know, car insurance, pay as you drive insurance. But similarly, in uh, home-based insurance and healthcare, you know, technology can help us identify a risk and, and reduce the risk and then in turn reduce the insurance premiums. So in the second part of, of this uh, kind of wrap-up uh, for the white paper, I want to dive a little bit more into the different categories of technology 
that actually can enable these cost savings. And we kind of distinguished uh, three sets of technologies, which kind of also are the phases uh, during which they will deploy. The first kind of category is what I would call first generation technologies, very much about connectivity and sensors. You know, the typical examples would be things like smart bins, smart street lights, uh, smart parking, then for utilities, smart water and smart meters. They kind of, you know, allow to achieve very significant cost savings. You know, for example, for street lights that can easily go uh, over and beyond 50%. Uh, some of these are linked to the maintenance practices that can be much more efficiently organized when you know where there is an issue in the network and, and to be much more uh, you know, uh, precise in terms of the, the type of maintenance uh, that is being offered. So very important. I think that's the stage where most cities are at uh, uh, as we speak here. I think the second set of technologies that can actually, you know, enhance the level of cost savings really is that whole area of the sharing economy, the service economy. And I would also say the, uh, the uh, power of community crowdsourcing. If you think about what that this can do for, for example, addressing peak demands, uh, which is always hard to address for cities, uh, but also allowing citizens and enterprises to participate in that offered by valorizing their own assets. And that's what the sharing economy is, is about. So typical examples would be, of course, smart mobility with ride sharing already having a huge impact on the availability of uh, more affordable uh, mobility and services. It's also an area, I think, where there's huge scope for public-private partnerships. Uber is already participating in some of the mass projects uh, in, in Europe. Second area is home and office space sharing with some, some real good thinking happening. Uh, energy is very important, micro and nano grids, uh, renewable distributed energy generation uh, is, is certainly helping a lot there. Uh, community parking services, Bosch is talking about that, Ford is uh, exploring that as well. You can even um, kind of envisage uh, citizens uh, sharing their private parking spaces or maybe also their you know, residential EV charging station, stations to other citizens. Again, something I think cities should try to encourage and, and promote, even on the level of security and intelligence gathering, I think that crowdsourcing uh, effort can be very important. So very important, I think, to consider uh, the sharing economy. I would say, especially for smaller cities, which might not command the kind of budgets that allow more you know, structural rollout of uh, platforms and infrastructure. Then the third category of technology really is, you know, what I would call the next generation technology, think automation, artificial intelligence, blockchain, IT, OT integration. That's where the transformational dimension comes into place. And that's where I think we can achieve, you know, even uh, more important and, and also structural cost savings. So it's an environment where we will use more holistic approaches trying to optimize uh, and reduce costs across the verticals through multi-point solutions. Also closing the loop, uh, things like demand response or automated demand response uh, uh, systems, if you think about energy and transportation in particular, but also, of course, opening platforms and systems uh, to, to achieve all that. So some examples here, I'm not, there's no time to go into too much detail here, but think about virtual assistance uh, governments can deploy for uh, their administrative services. Think about driverless car sharing, which will drop or, or make a reduction in price per mile from more than $1 per mile for car ownership to less than $0.10 cents per mile, which might even result in flat fee mobility plans. So that's really a moment where we think we'll see you know, citizens abandoning car ownership uh, in, in a massive way. You can think about commercial applications such as drone-based delivery, uh, or more generally freight as a service. Public safety will be able to benefit from, you know, surveillance uh, based on uh, AI. So using artificial intelligence to uh, analyze footage from uh, surveillance cameras. That's something NVIDIA has been launched in, in as part of this Metropolis platform uh, last year or even earlier this year. Uh, traffic management can be automated as well. So AI playing a very important role. I mentioned energy, you know, optimizing how energy is generated and consumed across the centralized grids, the microgrids, electric vehicles, and other types of electrification, I think is a huge 
opportunity for you know running these uh, networks more efficiently you can think about intelligence using ai for uh, security and intelligence and and more generally i think sharing data uh, in the market so kind of to uh, close this out uh, also want to talk very briefly about issues and challenges so we're looking at that really uh, large opportunity for cost savings so why is it that we don't see you know every city government you know uh, engaging in this uh, in, in, in a faster way I think there's three areas that we should mention here value chain complexities there's often a very long value chain between the city and actually the third party service providers that actually offer the services you know, uh, often uh, still uh, kind of governed by, you know, uh, supplier relationships, uh, long-standing supplier relationships and practices, operational practices that have been fine-tuned over many years. But it's kind of a leading to inertia. There's also kind of apprehension and fear about the impact of technology deployments on, you know, the processes, the management. There's also hidden costs for, you know, uh, employee training, there's psychological challenges and maybe emotional costs of change. I think there's a big role for the supplier or the tech ecosystem to help city governments understand how these can be overcome and being dealt with. It's a little bit what Stephanie was saying. It's not just about technology. It's also about these, these other aspects uh, we should be mindful of. And then finally, I mentioned automation. I mentioned AI you know, reducing employment, which is a politically quite sensitive uh, area. Uh, but I think the way we should look at it, that technology or rollout of technology always have a multiplicator effect on economic development and growth. So maybe jobs that might disappear, government paid employees uh, reductions might be offset by uh, new jobs created in the private sector. And also I think we should look at this like maybe freeing employees or government paid employees from you know tedious tasks and made them available for other very urgent uh, uh, tasks that needs to be done in, in, as part of the smart city so kind of redeploying employees into other jobs so i want to keep it here so again that white paper is available for download so feel free to have a closer look at it uh, thank you very much Okay, thank you, Dominic. Now we're going to transition to Cameron. I'm the um, executive director here at City Innovate Foundation. I'm one of the co-founders of City Innovate Foundation, which is a, um, a non-profit headquartered in San Francisco. It's a 501c3 base. Um, four years ago, myself and my co-founder, who was a um, ex-VP, at Apple decided to form this nonprofit really around how do we help government work with big enterprises around something that is a big major challenge for cities, which is basically their procurement, um, the procurement piece, which is the RFP. And just sort of going a little into Peter Hirschberg, who's the other co-founder into his history. I mean, he's been talking about smart cities since the late nineties, that it's not going to be IBM or Cisco selling you a billion dollar thing and sort of, helping cities figure out all the challenges they face, it's going to be the opposite. It's going to be a bottom-up, citizen-driven approach. Um, our ex-mayor, Gavin Newsom, who's running for governor in California right now, he wrote a whole book on smart cities called Citizenville. And Peter had a whole chapter in there really talking about startups, uh, citizens, government, enterprises, all working together in this new ecosystem and building a smart city. And one of the challenges we were seeing when we were, you know, we're both product driven from the private sector was that government are not in the business of product management or product development. Hence, we have this thing called an RFP. And how do we encourage and help government to work around this process as companies are innovating faster in a faster life cycle compared to government that take three to four years in getting an RFP out so they can get those solutions? That's sort of Dominic mentioned when you look at cost cutting. I mean, we're working with a lot of companies here that are now producing products that they did in a 10-year in cycle, in a 10-month cycle. So as we were creating City Innovate Foundation, we had the mayor of San Francisco sit down with us. We had partners such as Microsoft. Um, you know, again, very good colleagues of Peter who had left Apple, moved to, to Microsoft and sort of look at 
the ways that we can actually help resolve this, we brought in Stanford Center for Design and Research, and we realized that the, the best way for us to get cities and the private sector and the startups to work together was to bring everybody to the table and use design thinking, where we can clearly focus on what is the solution that we're trying to get to, and then start looking at unpacking the problems that the cities face and how technology can help us resolve that. So as we then started creating our mission, we realized that we're here to solve urban problems and we use something called open innovation, which is our sort of IP where we've developed something called a collider, which uses design thinking and bringing all these stakeholders together. And of course, when you look at government, the gov government always needs to make policy decisions based on empirical data. And I mean, we've seen the Obama, the ex-Obama administration sort of really focused that way from a federal point which is using data to make policy and empirical based decisions. So that's how we crafted our mission about four years ago. We then created something called Super Public, which was with the city of San Francisco, the state of California, and the federal government. And we created an innovation lab in the heart of San Francisco. And the first project that we got was a smart cities bit that the federal government put out there for all cities in the United States to apply for a 40 million grant uh, for becoming the first smart city. Uh, we led the bid for San Francisco with UC Berkeley. Uh, we raised roughly around $150 million in private sector capital from Google's Alphabet to Microsoft to Tesla, all writing letters that as we look towards the automated vehicle space, as we look towards reducing single occupancy and congestion, how can we have a smart city in San Francisco? 70 applicants, we made the top seven. Sadly, we lost. Um, and that went to uh, Ohio Columbus. They roughly raised about a half a billion dollars to go out there and work on this project. And this sort of in the end of their first year, we sort of regrouped here at City Innovate with the mayor's office. And we actually took on a project with uh, Miami Dade, which was upgrading the ticketing system, which we've been working closely on the data side right now with uh, Enna Digital. So, you know, just to sort of step back, I mean, one thing I can do is very quickly and briefly, as I've mentioned, run through the slides. Um, and, and, and it's very clear for us the challenge that we face uh, on slide, sorry, slide two, uh, and then going into slide three, you can, you know, sort of clearly see that we, we have this sort of um, mismatch of, how industry and cities want to work together. Again, pointing to sort of the issues Stephanie and Dominic have been pointing out is that we need government and the private sector to work better together. You know, industries ultimately have a solution to sell um, and cities want to buy that solution, but they're encumbered by this process. Um, and, and one of the biggest challenges that we've started to sort of work through now is how do we help government iterate and move a little faster. So through this collider that we've run with Miami-Dade, we've created a playbook which creates the best practice. And I'm, I'm happy in the, in the question session to really go down and, and, and delve a little deeper into how we help develop metrics that mayors like to talk about, which is we want to reduce congestion or we want to increase mobility to, you know, trip planners were saying, look, we just want all the data so we can better manage our city and we know exactly where to invest, you know, to put the new transit lines, the rail lines, to analysts who are saying, look, we just want specific use cases resolved and leading up towards Uber and Lyft bringing in the data to help, you know, uh, mush, mesh that in with the, with the public sector data and where we're looking then at the technology stacks that the private sector wants to bring in. So we're sort of reversing the flow of, Instead of the private sector coming in and saying, hey, I have this new technology, it's all on the cloud, or, you know, hey, it's going to be blockchain or IoT, but looking at it from the other side and humanizing it and saying, let's look at the problem that we're resolving for the city. Because then you're going to get the champions from the city who are going to be vested in working with you. And then understanding that we have in the United States a complicated RFP process. This is all being documented in a playbook that we're releasing in February going through all these steps with the use case with Miami-Dade. I was actually at Microsoft's headquarters yesterday where we signed in total 10 cities uh, from February, March, all the major cities in the United States that are looking at this to implement a smart city strategy. So 
I also sit on the Smart Cities Council here in San Francisco, where we have some of our bigger players. And these are the sort of bigger questions that we sort of tackle now, which is, let's not look at the solution, let's look at the problem, and then let's look at a multi-vendor approach in resolving that solution, where we can make sure that we have an open architecture that we can engage startups and the rest of the ecosystem. So, I mean, I'm going to keep just try to keep it short and sweet because of time. I think I'm on my 10-minute schedule, but yeah, I look forward to the questions. Thank you, Cameron. So we're going to move to my segment, the last segment of the webinar. So hello, everybody. My name is Vanya Subaric, and I'm a Director of Product Management at Cordant. Now, Stephanie and Dominic have talked about smart city trends, and Cameron spoke about smart city project governance. I will focus on our marquee smart city deployment um, of a transport data marketplace. So first, a little bit about Cordant. We are a newly formulated interdigital smart city focused business, although we have been operating in the IoT space for over five years. Now interdigital is a global public company with over 40 year long history and an extensive experience in all things wireless. Now Cordant is also a global business with the primary locations in the US and the UK. Now, the fundamental premise behind all our operations is open standards-based approach, and we will touch on how that has shaped our smart city strategy and this particular deployment, which I will discuss. So a bit of background on lessons learned and actually some questions um, came through the webinar on what are some of the challenges and lessons learned we had through the deployment. Uh, so let me cover that a little bit. So cities are eager to undertake projects that benefit their citizens and attract new businesses and investments to their areas. But like anything, there are some obstacles along the way. So some of these were mentioned by other webinar participants as well, but I will discuss a few. So probably one of the most commonly discussed is that the collected data is held in these inaccessible silos. So it is challenging to tap into the true potential of all the data. But these physical data silos are really only a part of it. Some of the other challenges include that we have encountered are, for example, technological. So how do you combine various systems, legacy and new, into one umbrella or one platform, if you will? Some of the other challenges are legal. So what should be the privacy terms of the data or the terms for sharing data? Some of the other aspects are financial. How do cities justify these investments to their, um, um, to their um, contingencies and find the sources of funding? And then last but not least, alluded to before as well, political, overcoming different departmental politics, resistance to change, um, the fear of um, job loss, and so on. But despite all the obstacles, many cities do understand that sharing of data is the key to unlocking new solutions to difficult urban problems. And hence, cities and regions across the world are undertaking various initiatives to consolidate their data, bring ecosystems together, and then create useful applications. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we have done in the UK over the past two years, is that we have worked with 10 other partners from different areas of the value chain to create a transport data marketplace. Most notably, uh, four UK transport authorities and a highways agency participated, contributing close to 300 transport data sources. Now, these data sources included um, things like road sensors, parking information, video camera feeds, and others. I like to think of it as being like um, the Amazon of transport data, where you can get raw data, processed and improved data, and offer services around those data products beyond the marketplace. The key is that all the data is in a centralized location where it can be easily discovered, shared privately or publicly, um, and for free or for, for free or for a fee. So the system that we had built leveraged Microsoft Azure infrastructure elements and is based on a one end to end service layer standard. So we talked a little bit, or Stephanie alluded to before, the importance of standards. So in our solution, we utilize one end-to-end -end service layer standard, 
that defines um, elements like data ingestion, charging components, and data access APIs. So this was a um, two-year field trial and is now being offered as a commercial service in the UK to the initial partners. And it's soon to be open to all who want to access the available data or offer their own data in the marketplace. So um, as important as the data consolidation and marketplaces are, they are means to an end for integrated operations, efficient infrastructure, and improved quality of life for citizens. So some of the example applications in the transport sector specifically that we and our partners have worked on included congestion, parking, and events management. There are some of the other applications like transit management, um, and also applications in the adjacent verticals, like for example, consolidating social services, CRM and applications with the transport data. I will conclude my portion of the webinar with a brief mention of some of these applications, but if you are interested um, to learn more, the um, videos on these um, applications are available on our website where the transport authorities themselves are talking about the applications and um, the value that it has brought to their operations. So the first application um, is a yearly Formula One event in Silverstone, UK, which hosts over 250,000 visitors in one weekend. Now you can only imagine the traffic and parking nightmare that would be. And so in this particular case, um, several different partners and authorities came together to analyze the traffic patterns around the venue itself, and then to be able to route traffic around and to the appropriate parking areas. Also, because this ran for two years, this kind of analysis pointed to the need for more optimal sensor placements for, for um, around the venue. So um, running for two years now, as I said, it is something that Silverstone, in their own words, said they cannot live without now. So it has been very helpful to that particular venue. Now, one of the other examples is also around the sporting venue, um, but it is slightly different. Um, this is for the bi-weekly um, uh, football events, and the goal was more about ushering users to other modes of transport that were available around the venue to reduce the car usage, as well as to utilize alternative car parks um, um, in, the, um, in the nearby area reducing the local congestion from 50% down to 3%. And the last but not least, um, this example is the case of a multimodal transport optimization around a busy shopping center. So Oxford County in the UK and their partners developed analytics and prediction models that resulted in increased usage of the local bus service and also the neighboring park and rides thereby again reducing the overall congestion in the historical Oxford city center area. So as I said before, more information on any of these examples um, can be found on our website. So I will conclude my portion of the webinar and would like to thank you for your attention. Open it now to Q&A. As a reminder, please submit any questions you'd like to us via the platform. I saw some come in already. And please, if you can, indicate the panelists towards whom you're directing the question, if, if applicable. So thank you, everyone. Great. Um, thanks, Vanya. So uh, this first question is for Cameron. So how do cities break down the silos within their own limits? And how do they connect with other cities? And what are the typical sources of funding, Cameron? So, I mean, yeah, I think the sources of funding, and I can take it as two questions. I mean, breaking down silos is as you've said it's a it's a uh, major issue and it's not one that is easy so when we run the smart city bid um with the mayor's office it came really from the top where we had to work with the data team we had to work with the transit agency we had to work with the communication team three agencies who don't normally communicate with each other and specifically around even when we looked at okay how are we going to share data as we do this so Normally, it is around having a strong mayor. We've seen this with Mayor Bloomberg out in New York. Mm -hmm. So 
breaking those silos is really tough. Um, obviously, if you have use cases where, again, I you know point back to some of the metrics that we looked at earlier, if you can show, hey, we improved congestion because we were able to take data from our Public Utilities Commission and SFMTA, our municipal agency, and we're able to derive these results. So results and champions are really what we have been seeing in the U.S. with strong leadership, normally coming from the top. Now, on the funding side, you know, one of the, one of the things that's sort of new for, for me, having lived in the U.S. now for five years, is that a lot of funding is not local. It's mostly at the state and federal level. Local municipalities have a, you know, we're, you know, San Francisco, you know, if you think about it right now, it's in such a, in such a great time now. There's a huge amount of revenue coming in from all these private sector companies, but the city is running a budget deficit this year. And so, you know, their cost is always, they're barely maintaining their existing system. So we've got to always look at state funding, state funding. There's a lot of cities that are sort of bidding for it. And the other piece of it is the federal side. So in our case, uh, in, in a lot of the California cities, when it's, uh, you know, we've been working with LA, with San Diego, and now with San Francisco, we're always looking at federal dollars. It's the only way that the federal government can actually implement um, any of the projects that they want to actually derive. So we have on the data side, for example, on data governance and exchange, NIST is always coming up with new standards on how we should adhere to data sharing standards and how we should build, be building a platform. I'm part of one of NIST's new committees on data governance and exchange. And the only way NIST can actually get these policies and these new uh, standards tested is, to buy, is, is by investing in a city or many cities and going out there and doing these pilot projects. And hence, this is where cities are constantly looking for their funding. They traditionally don't tend to come from the private sector. Again, private sector entities are sort of uh, looking at, you know, their own engineering time and their own engineering resources when it comes to these pilot projects. They're happy to do a one-off, but not on a scalable piece. So that's what we're seeing when it comes to, to funding and breaking down silos. Great. Thanks so much, Cameron. Uh, this next question is for Vanya. Uh, Vanya, how do smaller cities come into play in terms of incorporating smart technology? Thanks, um, thanks Ben. Yeah, um, this is a great question, and I think we partially covered it through the presentation. We may have not been explicit, but uh, it's a great question because large cities, they often have uh, reasonable funding, the staff, their vendor attention to execute on these kind of smart city projects. But smaller cities um, and regions, they don't necessarily have that kind of luxury. So what we have seen work is that um, in, in the UK, where we've done this project, the regions came together to pool their resources together, to pool the funds, to, um, to pool um, the technical resources, to pool their data together. And that way, they could create the economies of scale that are interesting enough for the developers who are developing applications around that ecosystem, um, also to, to get the government funding. Um, and, um, you know, another thing is, uh, is, is creating forums and, and joining some of these forums that, um, you know, Cameron mentioned before, I mean, the NIST and other organizations do have, um, uh, we have form formulated these smart city groups where smaller cities can can come in, submit their projects, and take advantage of the expertise and, and the funding that is available there. So that's sort of the, the best path that I would I would recommend for, for smaller cities and regions. Great, thank you. Uh, Dominic, I've got kind of a, a two-parter. Two so so um, I can repeat that. Uh, first of all, we hear a lot about uh, digital tr transformation. So when it comes to making cities smarter, that's a loosely used term. Uh, what is it that makes people think that digital transformation is critical and what makes digital transformation possible? So that's asked, uh, asked by uh, an audience. Okay. And what are, on top of that, you know, what are some commonly encountered use cases? Sure, yeah, that's a great question and everybody uses the term transformation. Um, and I'm not always sure you know, that's, that's used in the right way. So what it means for, from our perspective at ABI Research is technology redefining industries, reshaping industries, and I would even say reshaping the economy as a whole. 
if you think about, you know, for example, maintenance procedures, moving to preventive maintenance, uh, if you think about, you know, what I talked about in terms of the sharing economy, how that will, you know, very, you know, aggressively disrupt the automotive and, and transit industry, car as a service, mobility as a service, driverless car sharing, et cetera, et cetera. If you think about energy, you know, moving to from centralized uh, networks to distributed energy generation, you know, microgrids, nanogrids, uh, which will be, you know, managed and, and automated through demand response. So, and, and that's where, you know, what, what will make this happen, uh, what, what will make this possible? That was kind of the second part of the question, I think. That's where we need these next generation technologies. That's where we need things like prognostics, which uh, requires, you know, deep learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, that's where, you know, automation uh, comes into play. That's where platforms come, come into play because we need to optimize across verticals. So we need to have platforms that can aggregate information from energy, transportation, and other verticals. And we even, and I know this is a bit of an overhyped term, blockchain can also help bring the trust to, to pull this all together. So this is really what transformation is about, is technology used not for technology's sake, but for actually you know, redefining these industries and making them much more competitive, uh, much more efficient. And in the end, it's all about creating additional economic value, I would say. Great, thanks, Dominic. Uh, so a question for Stephanie. Uh, what are the most advanced smart cities that already exist, and what can we learn from them moving forward? Great question. So, you know, it's part of the research that we focused on was really not really, it wasn't really focused around which we believe are the, the most advanced now, but more around which we do we believe are going to really benefit. So first, you know, you talked about which ones are advanced now. And of course, you know, for the most part, a lot of your a lot of your much larger municipalities that have been very active and participated, and like Dominique said, that you know we're really active in 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 those application processes to try to get the, the federal funding to initiate those projects. Those are the ones that have been you know have been doing, I guess, a little bit more and have been standing out, and I would say much more successful in terms of um, smart city and. Those would include, you know, uh, you already mentioned San Francisco. Atlanta is really kind of an up-and-coming um, city that's doing quite a bit um, in the smart city space. Um, we also, when we were conducting the research, we found that there were a couple of cities that were common that we find that pop up quite a bit, which are um, Boston, Philadelphia, San Diego, of course, New York. Um, but from a smart cities benefit index, um, our top five were Boston, Chicago, Atlanta, Philadelphia, and Austin. And um, so in, in what we did with that particular index, we looked at a number of key metrics um, across these industry, across, I'm sorry, these municipalities. And we looked at what they're doing now. Um, what are some of the plans that they have in place? We pulled in quite a bit of demographic data as well as other metrics that were specific to the city in terms of size and, and budget and um, other areas around startup and innovation. And we pulled all of that together. We scaled and ranked that. And so um, I definitely encourage you guys to take a look at the executive report, which will come out next week. So you can dive into some of the more specifics. But, you know, what we found, too, is that in terms of those that we believe are going to benefit, if you look at our overall ranking, you know, you'll find some cities that are smaller in size. They may be more nimble. Um, they may be maybe more um, congested in terms of population or population per mile or per square mile. And we find that those that have a, a congestion or high population per square mile are also um, in dire need to have infrastructure automation and improvements. And of course, like Dominique and others mentioned on the call, you know, really we're, we're these big drivers are really more around cost savings, not co not revenue generation. So that we believe are those those areas are high, you know, drivers for the investment. And then of course, looking at other drivers, um, you know, just those that are really driven around citizen services. And I know that was mentioned as well by Vanya. So uh, in the end, you know, it's really not about who's who's smart today, but, you know, 
how many of them are advancing, are really developing departments in planning and leadership that are really going to move that across department and across agency. I think that's a that's a much more important um, characteristic, I believe, as we look forward to the future of smart cities. Great, uh, great. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Wonderful answer. Uh, this one's uh, the question, uh, an open question um, from the audience for Dominic. Uh, how well does machine learning, learning and deep and learning, learning help creating great effective smart cities? Yeah, uh, happy to take this one. I think I hinted at during my, uh, my presentation. I think it's very important. I mean, everybody talks about machine learning and deep learning and AI, and I think it will probably be more important for smart cities than for other, any other environment. So I, I, I could answer it quickly. It will allow to do everything in, in a more cost-affordable way and it will allow it to be much better at what we do. So that's where automation kicks in. Think about surveillance, you know, AI-based surveillance. I mentioned the NVIDIA Metropolis solution. You know, instead of having an army of, of operators watching screens, you can actually do it through AI. So uh, detecting anything suspicious on video footage. You know, mobility, obviously, driverless cars and drones very heavily will, will very heavily depend on uh, AI and deep learning and machine vision. But even areas uh, such as uh, security, cybersecurity, identifying, you know, millions of new uh, cyber threats being generated every day. There's no way we can still cope with it in a manual way with, with human operators. We'll have to apply AI, not only to detect and identify threats, but also you know, engage in automated response to sending updates uh, in an automated way. Maintenance practices will evolve very dramatically, running these networks, uh, water grids, uh, water distribution, energy grids. Uh, prognostics is a term you hear often again, very heavily dependent on deep learning to anticipate on whether something might break down in the future as opposed to be kind of more uh, reactive. So wherever you look, I think AI and deep learning will play a very, very important role going forward in smart cities. Great. Thanks for that. Um, and then this question will go to Vanya. Um, one second. Vanya, uh, can you discuss sort of the central role of telecoms in the smart city? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And um, um, telcos in general have a, a very important role. I mean, it's kind of starting from the infrastructure itself, which is necessary to enable all the different, um, all the different applications and collection of data and the, the deployment of the new IoT systems. I mean, their role is critical right there. But then, um, you know, we see a lot of telcos kind of taking a, a broader approach where they're offering their own platforms and solutions on top of um, a, a smart city. Um, another area where tel telco's role is very, very important is that a lot of the new smart city and the IoT devices are going to be quite small and, and limited in their capabilities. So their ability to offer these low power wide area networks and solutions like the narrowband IoT, for example, is another area where, where telcos are going to make their mark. So let me kind of leave it at that um, for now, Ben. Mm -hmm. Great, Vanya, thanks. Um, so I'm going to kind of ask this question and we'll see sort of who of our panel would, would be best for this. So how have we been able to overcome hurdles, both legal and political, to support healthcare data management uh, when multiple stakeholders are involved? I'll take that one. This is Stephanie. So I'm, I'm assuming you may be talking about, you know, the, the privacy um, and sharing of healthcare records and information. Um, it's been a, a major challenge. And, and of course, I think that t taking a step back when we're talking about smart cities, you know, you have to think about all of the interfaces. And of course, when you think about public safety, um, as, you're, as you're discussing public safety, you're interfacing with the public health care um, organizations and that information, that health data information is vital in terms of that response to that um, emergency situation. So from a political perspective, 
you know, we, we really have been driven around some of the regulatory um, requirements that are in place, whether that's through HIPAA, the Health Information Privacy um, Act, or other areas around when we develop new mobile products, there are requirements that are put in place, and that's regulated by the FDA. So, um, you know, you have to go through a process before that particular mobile device will be compliant. And a part of that compliance is also leveraging and looking at um, healthcare data and the data analytics and the privacy of, of health records. So whether that's electronic medical records or even other medical uh, records that might be part of communicating that healthcare um, data. And then and other organizations or, or really more uh, departmental the Department of Health in the, in the states is a very large regulatory body that continues to look at some of the innovation and automation happening from a health care data perspective and how do we really keep um, the privacy and security in place with health care records. And, then, and as well as, as we send information to um, Pharmaceut you know, pharmaceutical companies, um, as we fill prescriptions, as we share data across platforms. So it's, it's at this point in time, most of the regulatory and legal um, and activity has really been around some of the governing bodies that are making sure that these requirements are in place at healthcare organizations, HCOs, and that the, clin the clinicians are following these best practices to secure patient data. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, really great details there. Um, I think we have one, one time for one last question, and um, I think it's a pretty good one. So I'll end on this one. I'm not sure who would like to cover this, but how, how, how can IoT technology support smart cities? I'll take that one, um, and then we may, might have some follow-up. Yeah. So Internet of Things is really a broad term, similar to smart cities. Um, when you think about IoT, it, it includes things such as sensor networks. It includes things such as machine learning. Um, Dominique mentioned platforms, um, but the, the Cordon platform is, is definitely one of those on that list. And then you have to think about other things, you know, in the IoT kind of area. Asset management fleet tracking, fleet management, um, you know, all of these intelligent machines um, and the software and applications that are riding over those and whether that data is be collected, being collected at the edge or is being pushed to the cloud. So it's real. I think when you talk about IoT, IoT is an aspect of smart cities. It is a technology kind of um, overarching trend when it comes to different projects that are taking place but really i think you have to think about the, the whole technology landscape bringing together iot you know iot cloud artificial intelligence all of these tech terms that we've been talking about the interesting part about all of this is these ter these technologies are coming together which is making for more a more salient um application and solution for smart cities. And that's really where we're seeing IoT kind of forefront is that many of the smart city projects have some kind of IoT technology component. And that's a very important piece. Awesome. Does anyone else, uh, would anyone like to share maybe a quick piece on how the IoT technology is helping smart cities? I can sort of uh, share something very briefly just on sort of what Stephanie has been sort of running through uh, in San Diego that's actually happening right now where what we're seeing and I think it sort of points to two two questions that you also had in the past one was on you know the role telcos play because as you start putting these IOT devices out so there's a 40 million dollar contract that San Diego gave to Intel GE digital and AT&T and what we're starting to see is this sort of multi-vendor approach where GE is coming in and upgrading the lighting system and they're putting the sensors in place right now. AT&T is going to provide that connectivity because you need to push as you get towards autonomous vehicles, which is what they're probably going to use that technology, especially around the V2I, V2V space. You need to push that through and it's probably going to generate five petabytes of data every five minutes. So the connectivity has been a big bottleneck. And of course, just something Stephanie touched on, 
which is Intel is, you know, obviously, you know, competing here with NVIDIA, whether we sort of uh, do the computation at the edge or do we, you know, do it as Intel has always done it, which is centralized. So what we're starting to see is that you have these three big players coming together. And of course, the city of San Diego wants to ensure that, look, when we take the data, what are we going to do with all the data that's generated out of it? And what are the policies and regulations? Now, HIPAA on the healthcare side has great regulatory bodies. They have actually been working at this for 20 years, which is how do we share data that is actually you know, confidential? And you know, what are the privacy and security implications of it? But when you look at the smart city space and, you know, ITL, which is a laboratory out of NIST, they've put standards, but you don't need to adhere to them. With HIPAA, you do. You have very clear rules and guidelines of how you share that data. When, you know, the privacy, all the PII pieces to it, we're working here with UC Davis right now on campus that has actually taken all the energy and water data in San Francisco, 80 million records and actually created the privacy and security mechanisms that conform to, you know, um, to, to, to NIST standards, to the FTC and FCC standards. Of course, when we look at GDPR in EU, which is a little tougher, there it's going to be mandatory in May of next year that you have to follow these rules like HIPAA. We don't have that happening in the U.S., so it's sort of voluntary. So right now what we're starting to see is, is that the cities who are sort of figuring out how do we localize some of these rules and regulations and then as we're sort of deploying these IoT technologies, we're starting to see telcos and, you know, the GEs of the world and the Intels of the world coming together. And of course, Intel has made a big push. I mean, they're, you know, a, a big player who is working with us in San Francisco, but they're getting into the AV space now, too. Hence their, their reason in partnering with some of these bigger vendors. So we're starting to see some really good use cases as we're working with San Diego that other cities are sort of looking at and saying, well, we want to follow this. I mean, and how are you sharing your data? What are the policy and rules that you're putting in place? Um, you know, and, 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 and there's a big push towards it now. Great. Uh, I think that's a great place to wrap us up this webinar. Thanks, Cameron. And, and thanks to all our panelists. Uh, I want to thank our presenters for spending some time with us today and all of our audience members for participating in this event. Again, you'll be receiving an email from us afterwards with a link to the on-demand version of the presentation. Uh, take care, and we'll talk with you soon.